thank you, Driven Society. Thank you so much, Dropbox, for giving me this space, this platform, and for all of us to have what I think is a really important conversation about technology, given the nature of our society, economics, and politics right now. I think that we've designed a lot of our tech, and it's kind of backfired. And so a lot of what I do is talk about digital anthropology, tech philosophy, and media ecology, which are all is definitely a mouthful. But it's basically, again, just studying the nature of how technology changes our environments, changes our behaviors, and essentially changes the relationships we have with each other. The other thing that I want to say before I get started is that the way I talk about technology is sort of different than I think we're used to. When we speak about tech, we have a narrow definition or view. We're usually talking about electronics, software. So don't freak out if I talk about technology and I'm talking about like tables and spoons. And the reason why is because I think that part of what can do us justice in designing more healthy tech is, is expanding the definition of it. And so the way that I look at it is any modification of nature, right? It's any way that humanity is trying to extend our limited nature to navigate the universe. And when we look at it that way, I think it can help us design things that are not just market friendly, but human friendly. So thank you so much for being here. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna start with a story. Is that cool? How's everyone feeling? Everybody just chill and relax. It's like the after work time, so people are still in work mode. It's, we're all good, it's good. Um, so here's the story. So there's a person named Gary, and Gary is an inventor, okay? And he is also a golfer, and he has invented this special putter for golfers to get better accuracy in reaching the hole in the game. And so Gary is, really excited. He is convinced he's going to be a billionaire. He knows that this is going to make a bunch of money. So he runs to pitch it to the US Golf Association for a patent because he has to file it through them for them to allow it in the league. So he gets all excited. He gets ready and he pours his heart out. He's like, yo, this putter is about to make everybody so much bread. Like, you know, this is going to be amazing. And he's ready to walk out with like a million dollar check right there. But to his surprise, he actually gets rejected. And the US Golf Association tells Gary that they appreciate his enthusiasm, but they have to reject his idea. And he's like, what are you talking about? Like, how do you not see that I'm gonna make you super rich? And they explain, we've approved patents like this before, and we found that they actually take away the whole point of the game. And it's like, what do you mean? He's like, well, if your putter makes it too easy for the players, then it kind of takes away the joy for them then the audience members don't really enjoy the game because it's too simple. Then our ticket sales slow down. And so again, look dude, it makes it so there's no point of the game. And so of course Gary is upset because he realizes he's not gonna be a billionaire. But this story is based on a true story. And a fun fact is that you can look this up, the US Golf Association actually has a large lab specifically staffed to reject these types of inventions. And it's not because they don't work or because they're difficult to use. It's actually because they're too effective and they're too easy to operate. So think about that. That's a very symbolic story because in my opinion, the golf world is onto something that the rest of the world is starting to figure out. And that is that better ain't always better. Sometimes you can optimize something to a point that it cancels out, it backfires. So that brings us to the question of tonight and the question I literally lose sleep asking myself, which is what is human friendly technology? Because it's not as simple as we think. It's not the first thing we think about. And unfortunately, you know, as I go into tech companies and talk to them, they are using what I would call crude spectrums of design. And, and I think most of them aren't even thinking about the spectrums they're using. But the spectrum of design you use determines the human friendliness of your design. And usually, especially in our uh, marvelous country, when we have an idea, we're not thinking, oh, is this human friendly? We're thinking, what? Will this sell? Right. And so when we're thinking, will it sell, we have these crude spectrums, which I'm going to go over. And I'm going to go over like the most common ones and then give you examples of how they backfired. Super simple, everyday examples and then go into the one that I think will help us design healthier tech. 
Are you excited? Yeah. Okay. Um, so don't laugh, but like the first one is good and bad. Like literally people will be like, this looks really good. This tastes really good. This makes me feel really good. We don't design things to feel bad. We design things to look, taste, feel good. And we went all the way in with that with our food. There was a Gary in the food industry that was like, these cupcakes, just sell them. They sell like crazy, just add sugar, add these oils. We don't know what they really do, but just they sell and they taste good. They make us feel good. And the second that that industry got birth, what ended up happening? We had a whole obesity epidemic. We had increased heart disease, diabetes, all these things, because relative to the junk food, the organic whole food tasted bad, right? So we got a little ahead of ourselves, and now we're trying to reverse it. Now we think we're cute with like trying to eat kale, which is great, but it's because we went so far off into that junk food, processed food land, and that absolutely has to deal with technology. When you're talking about processed food and like hyper farming, you can't do that without tech. The next common spectrum is easy and hard. People aren't in these tech companies designing things to make life harder. That's not gonna cut the check. We want things that feel easier, that are easier to get, right? And I do too, like, come on, I Amazon Prime things every day, so I'm about this life too, but you know, I do still, I'm still hard on myself about like, what am I losing, right? So everyday example of that is conversation. I talk about this a lot. There was a Gary who was like, communication's gonna change forever. You're not gonna need to call people, you can just text them. It's the same thing. He was going in there pitching that as like, it's easier, it takes less effort. But now, what happened when we started that? Now we're in a whole mess in, as far as our relationships go, because we're trying to communicate with a very crude technology that's not super effective. The, and again, the phone call is harder because it takes more effort and focus and concentration. So we were like, yo, this is easier. It does the same thing, but does it? The third common spectrum of design is cheaper and expensive. If you work at a company and you're like, I have this really good idea and it's gonna cost people way more money than what we're charging now, are they gonna listen to you? No, we're incentivized to design things to be cheaper. And this is really fun, but again, it backfires and it really destabilizes a lot of our economy. One of the most clear ex expressions of that is with clothes in the fashion industry. So, if you want a good quality piece of clothing, you have to pay the person who's actually sewing it a wage that they feel is worth their skill set. And then if you want it to be made out of good materials, that means they're coming out of the ground, they have to weave them together, they're natural scarce materials, and they have to weave them into fabric. And that's not cheap. Clothes and that whole process is not a cheap thing in general. But there was a Gary who was like, we could do that, or we could use cheap synthetic materials and hire really cheap labor and sell really cheap clothes. And so now our expectation of what clothes and a lot of things are, are cheaper than what they are reflective to the actual economy. Because we think if a shirt is, can be $10 and why would I pay $50 for it? Well, because it's coming at a tremendous cost. I don't know if you guys know about the garment factory collapse that happened in Bangladesh a few years ago. This was at a fast fashion factory. It killed over a thousand people, right? And this is because someone was trying to fit the spectrum of how do we make it cheaper? Yeah, it's cheaper on the rack in the store, but the costs show up in other ways, right? So what am I really talking about here? I'm talking about food, I'm talking about conversation and relationships, I'm talking about clothes, and these are the fundamental parts of life. If you look at uh, the hierarchy of needs, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, this is like what you need to survive. And so we're throwing what we need to survive in these crude spectrums, and they're not actually giving us what we need. So nourishment, connection, protection from the elements that can be through clothes or through your shelter, right? We need these things. And so the question is, are these spectrums of design serving us? What do you think? No. <laughs> yeah, what are we losing? And what spectrum of design could we be using instead? So 
The question is also, just because these things are not as easy to deal with, does that mean we should get rid of them? Because if you look around, it seems like that is what we're trying to do. Like we think we're gonna outwit this and get away with it. And so my work is all about what do these things offer life, even though they're more complicated, even though whole foods are kind of a pain in the butt to find, to buy, to cook. Well, it might actually help my health. Even though this conversation is more difficult to have, not on texting, what can it give me? Well, it can make me feel more connected to somebody. Rejection, basically the access we have to pleasure in our society makes it so that people aren't risking being rejected as much, uh, particularly in, in romantic relationships. And so if people don't feel that rejection, then they're missing out on the chance to push through and have resilience. And then again, with the quality clothes, that represents more than just fashion. I want you to see it as like protection from the elements. And what it does is that if we, if the clothes are made with quality, it's really reflecting a sustained environment. Because again, fashion is, I think, the, the most wasteful industry right now. And economic stability, if you're actually paying the people and paying what the raw materials actually cost, then it's gonna reflect a healthy economy and not the really crazy bubbles we have going on right now. Does this make sense? Am I going over your heads? No, because we're New Yorkers. Okay, so the question is what spectrum does give us human-friendly technology? We know it's not the other stuff. So now you're like, all right, Alex, what spectrum is it? And I'm like, well, that's what I've been thinking about. Um, yeah, I, I've really been spending the past like six to seven months really trying to figure out this question. You know why? Because I was thinking, oh, well, like, Technology should make our lives better. But I'm like, is better really the best word? Because someone's better is always someone else's worse. So it made me dig into it deeper. And so the spectrum that I think can be helpful, not necessarily perfect, but definitely give us a better track, is meaning and no meaning. Does it give my life meaning, or does it take meaning away from my life? Because it doesn't matter what religion, race, person you are, we all know what it feels to have meaning, to feel like life is worth it. Why is meaningful different than good or bad? It's because meaningful things might not be easy, they might actually be hard, right? It's not about making things easy. They might not be uh, pleasurable, they might actually be painful. Life can suck, we all know that, but if there's a reason, if there's something that's giving your life meaning, then you're more willing to go through it. But what happens in a culture where people feel like life isn't worth it? This reflects millennials experiencing symptoms of depression. And you can see that sharp rise after what, 2011? What was happening then? Right? Mm. So these are clear signs that depressive symptoms were going up. This chart shows teenagers seriously considering suicide and intentional injury. Again, look at the years, right? So what happens when people don't think life is worth it? They want to hurt themselves. They want to leave the culture. They just don't want to exist. And then you can see this is a chart that shows the hours spent on electronic devices. Again, look at the years. So there's a direct correlation and more and more of this research is coming in. It takes a long time for these institutions to give it to us. And so I'm always like, just use your common sense. But when I present these things and you know, talk to companies, I have to come through with the data. So it's here. So this is what happens when people don't think life is worth it. And if you live in this culture, you see it and you feel it. So the next question, and these are all questions I ask myself, but I'm encouraging you all to ask yourselves when you leave here because we're in this together, right? What makes life feel worth living? Well, this is the other thing I study. And here's a few findings, maybe you've heard of them. One, feeling connected and bonded to the people around you. You'd be surprised, even one or two bonds can completely change your relationship with life. Mm -hmm. Feeling like you have someone to rely on, someone who can rely on you, very simple thing, for some reason it seems very alien to the culture and we're very afraid of feelings. Um, but that can make life feel worth living. The other common thing is having an empowering role in your community. 
What am I doing here? Is my job pointless? Do I feel like I'm doing something that doesn't make sense or doesn't actually do anything to my community? People feel empowered and inspired and like they want to keep going when they're, when they're set up to be good friends, good siblings, good partners, good business people. And I have work that talks about how a lot of us don't feel prepared for those roles, but having an empowering role in your community gives you purpose. Uh, the third one, which I love, is room for playfulness and joy and celebration. Again, like this is like super common sense stuff, but we really, I feel like, don't take as much time to think about it. So I go to the park a lot. I live by the park in Brooklyn. And so I go to the park to just be a nerd and whatever. And I can count on one hand how many people in the park actually are there to enjoy it and how much people are like using the park as like something to extrapolate like a, a unit of measurement or an output. You got people running. You got people walking their dogs. Like people are doing everything besides just enjoying the park. And I've read a lot of Frederick Olmsted, who's actually the designer of both Central and Prospect Park. And the whole reason why he designed those parks is because his philosophy was that if you live in a city and you don't get exposed to nature, you'll go insane. <laughs> that was literally why he felt compelled to design the parks. And if you think about your childhood and how important the role of that park played on your on, on you growing up. And Prospect Park looks so natural that it looks like they sort of built a fence around it, but it's all designed. It's all man-made. It was someone who cared enough to build that into the city. So we live in a very work-dense culture. We work hard. We don't play as hard. We don't celebrate as hard. And celebrate can't just be liking people's pictures. Like, I see you, sis. I mean, like, go out. <laughs> Pop a bottle. You know what I mean? Do some karaoke. Um, feel it. What are you working so hard for if you're not going to celebrate? So those are part of what makes life worth living. So here's a great quote from one of my favorite technologists, Edward Tenner, who he's basically saying, when it comes to tech, performance is not the measure of value. Let that sink in. Performance is not the measure of value. It's our human needs are complex and sometimes paradoxical. So he's basically saying it's not as simple as thinking something's good. Sometimes the, the good thing can be bad for you. Sometimes the bad thing can be good for you. And that's just who we are. That's our nature. So my version of that in a corny one sentence tweetable is no tech can make life perfect, just worth it. I sit back, I'm on Twitter, I'm sure you are, are too. And like you see these tech companies racing to, for the AR race or the cryptocurrency race. And, there, and I see a lot of inventions trying to eradicate difficulty or sadness or like grief. And I'm like, it would be really cool if we could figure out how to do that. But every time you try, it's making it worse. It's making it worse. So instead of trying to make life this heaven, how can we just make things that are, again, make it feel worth it? Make sense? The next question is, how do we design tech to have more meaning? How do we do that? We know it needs to have more meaning, but like, where do we get started? So I've been theorizing, and I've come up with four qualifiers so far. Maybe there'll be more, maybe not. But this is what I think can help design more human-friendly tech. So the first is technology that is sensitive to your emotions. And I'm going to be giving examples for all this, so you don't, it's not abstract land. So technology that does not assume technical perfection on your end and does not deceive you. Y'all gonna know what I'm talking about really fast. So technology that's not sensitive to your emotions usually comes from automated communications that can't, they don't have the ability to consider the context of your environment or your intelligence. So some examples of non-sensitive technologies are financial and health tracking alerts Who's ever signed up for like a financial tracking thing and it's like, whoa, why are you telling me all this stuff right now? I'm just trying to go to bed. <laughs> just trying to go to bed. Or like, you know, like health tracking. I was getting a manicure the other day and my watch was like, it's time to stand up. I'm like, you need to relax. Getting a manicure. <laughs> um, so those can be non-sensitive to your environment and they can really mess up your mood and your day and they don't, they don't know the whole story, right? 
Um, the other one I put down here are high definition cameras like for consumers. So here's the thing, I love cameras. People, like a lot of my photographer follow, uh, readers go in my DMs and like, oh, why are you so anti-pictures? I'm not anti-pictures, here's the thing. I'm all about high definition cameras if we're trying to like look at rocks on Mars or like look at microscopic images. But one of the main selling points for most cameras is, is, is high, how high definition it is. And that's a lot of pressure when you are sort of expected to put it in your face all the time. And I think it's responsible for causing all types of body dysmorphias and uh, increase in, in low self-esteem, especially for younger people. And I don't really know why we have to have such high definition cameras as consumers every day walking around. That's just my take. I don't feel like it's that sensitive to our emotions. And it don't be looking like how you look in the mirror either, but that's for another day. Um, <laughs> automated messages sent to deceive as live interaction. So remember on social media when like you were getting a bunch of likes or comments and it's like, this is not you. It's like obviously a bot. You're trying to trick me. Or if you've ever signed up for like texting or email and it's like trying to deceive you as if the person just sent it to you. It's, it's an icky feeling. It's kind of just like, keep it a buck. Like, I'm a millennial, I can handle an automated message. And so what I, especially from a marketing standpoint, you don't want to lose your consumer that way. It's just disclose that, hey, this is an automated message. Here's the piece of content, blah, 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 blah. But when you're, when you're trying to de deceive your actual presence with a bot, that's not sensitive to the person's emotions. And then, of course, public-facing gamification metrics like buttons and followers, been getting a lot of news lately. A lot of it is because of the backlash that people are going crazy with these like buttons. It's just, it was a little innocent feature that they put in and it caused, again, it backfired because it was just about making people feel good. So technology that's not sensitive to your emotions, there's more, but the way you can identify them is when they feel super high pressure, when they feel failure prone, like they're sort of setting you up for failure, it can feel like an insult to your intelligence. And the way I like to put it is, it can kind of feel like conditional love. This is the worst, where it's like, you'll get rewarded if you behave the way that I want you to. But other than that, I'm gonna make you feel crap, like crap. So that's how it feels. Some examples of sensitive technologies are things like musical instruments. If you pick up a guitar, you don't have to be perfect at it, but it can still play a nice sound. Right? It's not expecting technical perfection on your end. It's not gonna text you if you spent a little bit more than you thought you would this month, right? Polaroid cameras, I can give a whole lecture on Polaroid cameras and the reason why is because, think about it, Th that camera was invented around the 60s and the 70s. We still use it today because it it's designed that well. When things are designed really well, it doesn't matter what era you're in. And if you also think about Polaroid cameras are more about the experience. It's not about how high definition the picture is. It's actually more like, I feel like people enjoy it for the charming part that it's not that high definition. And it considers the context of your environment. Another example, emojis and GIFs, particularly like the new emojis, like the ones you can like use with your face and facial expressions. I think GIFs are probably one of the most emotionally intelligent sort of units of measurement on internet communications right now because sometimes what you can't say with words, you can say with a reaction. And it's nice that you can kind of like shop around and be like, yep, that's the one. <laughs> um, and and we're, we're so good at picking up people's emotions from looking at just the way you, your face looks. Um, I put cribs and rocking chairs, cribs meaning like the rocking cribs. So this is what I mean is what's so cool about technology is that when you look at it this way, like I started to research like who invented the rocking chair, um, which apparently was Benjamin Franklin, but I have some questions about that. Just because, just because I just feel like uh, I, can, I can see many women, you know, rocking babies and being like, yo, if this just, if the chair did it, this would be easier to put the baby to sleep. But rocking chairs are about soothing the baby to put to sleep, very human friendly. Uh, weighted blankets are our new hot thing for the millennials since we're all lonely and depressed. Um, and they are meant to, you know, again, they're, they're taking into consideration that this is not a robot, this is a human, and it wants this feeling of weight. 
So sensitive technology feels, it, can, it feels more fun. It feels like it's more about the experience and the output. And it can be meaningful without being perfect. The picture doesn't have to be perfect. The music doesn't have to be perfect. These things are not expecting you to be a robot. They're sort of designed with this bias of knowing like, oh, this is a human. The second qualifier is that it nurtures or enhances a sense. Nurtures or enhances. Does not exploit your eyes, your taste, your touch. I think particularly in the States, we really like blast every, every sense as much as possible. You do not want to see me at the airport. That is when I'm the most bougie, cranky person because I'm just trying to find something to eat and everything is all like processed and gross and expensive. And like if I finally find one, who, like, is anyone else like this? Don't leave me out here by myself, please. I find like a place, this happens to me all the time. I find a place, bright lights, processed food, blasting music. I'm like, it's 6 a.m. Right, and I'm, and I'm so sensitive about my environments because I care about this kind of stuff. So when I'm put in those environments, I'm like, whoa, like what is the point of this? I'm just trying to enjoy my food. So super normal stimuli, which is what Gary Wilson calls it. He's a great person to study. Um, super normal stimuli such as junk food and the other stuff that I'll mention in the other slides can pump and dump dopamine in your system and cause addictions. Addictions make people depressed and give people anxiety takes away meaning. So here are some examples of technologies that don't nurture and enhance. Obviously, any, anything highly stimulant. So highly stimulant VR games and video games in general, junk food, processed food, clickbait, sensationalized news. So journalism has had to assimilate to how stimulant the, the climate is, and they've had to fall for this trap of like sensationalizing their stuff just to pay the bills and it's coming at a crazy cost. High-speed internet porn, highly stimulant. Again, gamification metrics falls under this because they're using the competitive edge of it to keep you coming back for more. So these technologies can feel like addiction. They can kind of feel like you're gambling, like you have loss of self-control, impulsiveness. They can desensitize you. They can cause you a short, uh, give you a short attention span. They just kind of make you like, Ugh. They desensitize you. So what are some examples of technology that actually nurtures and enhances? Eyeglasses. You can't see, eyeglasses help you see. Prosthetic limbs. You need, you, you, something happened, an accident happened, this amazing technology can help you walk, can help you hold things. Uh, walkers. Anyone here ever go to the Brooklyn Promenade? <laughs> so there was like a week that I was going like every day in a row and sweetest little story, this, this older gentleman with the walker would like walk up and he would go right to the edge and just stare at the water and the buildings. And I will say, when I do see the people in the park enjoying it, it's always older people. And, and I think it's because either they come from an era where they know how to appreciate those things and or they, they, you know, they know they're in a different life stage and they're just trying to appreciate things. So he would walk up with the walker and like, he's so fragile. I don't know how he's walking around. And I would, you know me, I'm a nerd, so I'm in the back with my North Face, like looking at the actual walker. And I'm like, yo, that's such a dope piece of tech. Like, look at this thing, look at the wheels. Like, even though it's like, you know, like to me, I'm like, that is such a compassionate piece of tech. Somebody must have been like, I really want to help my grandma or my grandpa walk around. And I know when I'm that age, I'm gonna definitely be, you know what I mean? Going to the park, doing my thing because it's going to give my life meaning to look at the buildings or whatever I want to look at. I was just like, I'm just so happy because he wasn't with anybody. It was just himself. So if he didn't have that, would he be able to, to go do that? No. Hearing aids, another one. And so what is the trend here? It supports natural characteristics. It's not blasting in. It's supporting what already is organically to your nature, like even like foot soles or like back support, right? It's just enhancing what, what you already got. Uh, the third one. The last two are like the big bulky ones and I'm probably gonna have to expand into them deeper in a separate video or something, but y'all can follow with me, y'all got this. 
So the third one is harmonious tech to technique ratio. I'm gonna break this down. Basically, uh, the technical definition is that it doesn't burden the technology with too much utility and it expects effort and skill from its human counterpart. So, to put it in easy terms, every time a technology is born, it's born with a fraternal twin. People don't know this. People think if you just invent the tech, that that's it, that's all that needs to be, that's all that is being born. But the fraternal twin is called technique. Or these are little babies. And the tech is the object itself, or in some cases, the software. The technique is the skill. It is the human element. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, think about your hair, especially the, the fellas, right? The object is the buzzer, right? But you can't just give anybody the buzzer because they might mess up the line. The technique is the person who can give you exactly what you're looking for. Or if you think about food, you give two people the same ingredients, say, all right, make this pie. It's not the ingredients, it's the technique of the person. And we've really lost sight of this. We don't really have that much people with techniques in our generation. I'm gonna tell you why. So the example I put here is like, the object is the stove, the technique is knowing how to cook. But when we design tech without thinking about this other baby, we design things like microwaves, which are not bad, but microwaves are a perfect example of the technology being burdened and the technique being forget about, forgotten about. Because when you cook with the microwave, you don't need to know how to chop stuff up and wash it and pick the fruit and put the flame on low and high. You don't need to know. All you need to know how to do is boop, 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 right? That's it. That's the technique. So a lot of us think we're out here cooking, and our mom is like, what are you doing? And so these types of technology causes a disharmonious T to T ratio. Does it, is this making sense? OK. So another example I'm giving is the bow and arrow. And this is really important when we're talking about weaponry, because when the bow and arrow was invented, it birthed the technique of needing to know how to load it to aim and shoot the prey. That's hard. Here's the other thing about technique. It cannot be taught by a machine. Some, another human has to teach you how to do it. And a lot of us are trying to learn techniques through simply Google or YouTube, which can be helpful. But you know that if you just had a mentor or actual person, they could help you take it to the next level. So the reason why I think it's specifically important when we're talking about weaponry is because you look at our lethal friend, the automatic gun, it requires less technique from the human than a, even, even a manual firearm, like back in the day, you couldn't just shoot the thing, you actually had to like crack it open, gunpowder, like you had to know what you were doing. But automatic weapons can give the desired result of injury or death with a simple click of a trigger. Remind you of anything? Boop, boop, boop. Like most of our techniques in our generation is boop, boop, boop. We're trying to make buttons for everything. Like this button gives me food, this button gives me a car, this button gives me a girlfriend, uh, you know. We, we, we turn everything into a button. No technique. Um, and, and this is what I would call a disharmonious T to T ratio because it requires very little technique to get very lethal results. And technologies like this, once they are invented, it causes a mess. A mess. So automatic weapons, automatic cars, because even, I'll talk about like even non-automatic cars take more technique, right? So these technologies are lethal, they are risky, they are prone to accidents, and they are very difficult to regulate on a legislative level. Once they're here, they're here, and you got to deal with them. So I'm going to be diving into this more in another video because there's an interesting point in history where Japan successfully managed to get all the guns off their island, which was like never done before, because again, they, they were doing what the US Golf Association did. They're like, yo, we want to have a war, but this gun thing is a little too much. Use the sword. And the Japanese actually, in their culture, a lot of it is based on technique. If you think about the sushi, the samurai, there's a lot. So it's very fascinating thing. But in, in Western culture, particularly in the States, we just want a button. So examples of harmonious T to T ratio are again, stick shift cars, 
You gotta be focused. You can't really text and drive with a stick shift car. Pens and handwriting. You say different things when the actual medium of the technology requires more from you. And this is really where the artists shine, because the artists know this. For example, with tattoos, perfect example. Like, yo, I want a lion right here. You can't give the tattoo gun to just any artist, right? And so this is where the artist is like, yo, but it's the way I use the camera. It's the way I sew the clothes. It's the way I design the website. It's not just the website designer. And unfortunately, we don't really think of it that way until you learn the hard way. So examples of technology with a more harmonious T to T ratio can feel challenging, but empowering. Once you learn how to master it, you actually feel like, okay, this is cool. I, I know how to work this thing. And it depends on your special touch. It depends on your commitment to perfect it. It's not gonna use itself. The last one, presence. Who's heard me talk about this before? Yes, yes, this is my favorite one. So when we're talking about depression, anxiety, suicide, a lot of it is because we feel like people aren't being present in our lives. We feel like we don't have presence. You have a lot of attention. It's not the same as presence. Being, not just looking, not just wanting to be nosy, but being with you, or you being with someone, listening, all that. And we can do that with technology. It's really weird that we don't do it as much yet. So what I mean is uh, technology that deepens presence within yourself or lets you feel the presence of other people around you. So the other important thing about communication, which is what I study specifically, is that effective communication is about, the number one component is, is presence. If you want your message to successfully go to the receiver, there has to be presence there. Well, guess what? Most of the stuff we're using to communicate with each other doesn't have it. Texting, email, social feeds, most dating apps, this is how it works. There's, and there's a feed. They all look the same if you think about it. There's the texting inbox, Gmail inbox, your social feed inbox. You dump information in it at this time, and then you hope the person got it, like when they check at another time. And so, of course, this is going to affect what you say. Of course, it's going to make it more liable for something getting lost in translation. Of course, it's going to maybe leave important things left unsaid. Conversations are not supposed to work like that. It's cool if, like, that's your secondary mode or third mode of communicating. And I also talk about like when we invented texting, we did it on the numbered keyboards and they cost 99 cents. And it was never about using it as the first method. We just started to do it because it was easier and cheaper. So this don't make no sense to me. I, I really think our kids are gonna look back and be like, what was wrong with y'all? Like, how did y'all make it work? So examples of tech with presence are even just the little typing bubbles I know y'all not gonna act like the, they don't give you little butterflies. Like, oh, there they are. <laughs> FaceTime, great example. Any video messaging, video chat, you're you're present with the person. Phone calls, again, you have to you know you have to be present to be in those conversations. Dropbox paper or any paper sharing software. When you're going in, you can see the other person is there, right? It, and you can it's an energy shift. You feel like okay, cool, like we're 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 all here now, okay. Radio, I don't know if any of y'all watched my IG story about radio, I had a moment. But radio is present in the sense that it, it's a unifying thing so that when one song is playing, you know that your whole community is listening to it. And that gives you a different feeling than like you being on the train trying to get your song to work and the Spotify or whatever is not working. Um, it's a very isolated experience. And Oh, my friend Joanna Montgomery, I, I, I wanted to give, you, to give you a demo to see it, but basically she invented a pillow for long distance relationships where one person lays on the pillow, the other one lights up, letting the person know they're there, which at first sounds a little creepy, but actually really helps couples. Like, I don't know if you've ever been in a long distance relationship, but knowing that person's like there on the pillow can sometimes be even more intimate than like being with the person. You know, sometimes you get hot and stuff and you don't want them on you. Um, <laughs> But, so, do you see the difference? Like, we can, the internet lets us feel present, but we're not designing stuff to do that. And that's really weird. So, the, the way it feels is that it reduces the pain of physical distance. Oh, another fun fact about that pillow. So, she made it for couples, 
But one of the biggest children's hospitals called her and was like, do you think we could use these with our patients? And she just signed a huge contract with these kids who are, who are actually, there's research that they're healing faster and with more ease because their loved ones are on the pillow with them. Yeah. Meaning. Because again, life is not perfect. Nobody wants to deal with their child being in the hospital, but since they're there, what can we do? What can we build? Right? It's real stuff. And it encourages effective communication. So here they all are, the four of them. Um, and this is what I've been thinking about for a while, for how to design human-friendly technology. And so I want to wrap it up by saying this. When we design technology with crude spectrums that don't factor in meaning, it can take away joy from the player, which can take joy away from the crowd, ticket sales slow down, and eventually can make us forget the whole point of the game. Thank you. <laughs>